I'm Mark Amos. I'm the assistant coach for um, the 18s with uh, Justin's team. Uh, Justin's our head coach for, for the 18s. Uh, Rob, this is Rob Wade, uh, who actually started the Zephyrs organization. And uh, Rob is basically um, also the head coach at Mid American Nazarene. I'm an assistant there. And he is our source of network for various organizations, various coaches, uh, colleges, and things. So, so Rob's impact on our organization, uh, he, he used to have a team and stuff, but is, is more kind of this behind the scenes <laughs> benefactor that I, I kind of keep him up to date as, as far as like what we're doing as different teams. Uh, Tiffany Craig is our 16s coach. And then Kristen Bromley is, is our four teams. So I, you know, we got we got several new faces. Is kind of our intention, or kind of my intention, is kind of be the point man for our organization to get kids where where they need to be and, and keep pace for all three teams. Uh, I, I just seem to have a lot more latitude. Our four teams and eight teams, we practice together. Uh, Tiffany played for me when I was coaching high school, so you know it, it's just kind of like that. Uh, our 16 teams, being up north, we don't get a chance to, to mesh with all the teams. So you know, I really emphasize the importance of this uh, parents meeting, so that people really understand the, the purpose of you know what we're trying to do, what our mo, because you don't know what what you don't know. First off, and we have found with our 18 team, with our kids coming in and, and new parents or anybody that, that starts new with, with our squad, we found almost with 100% success, if we sit down with the player and the parent to explain the process uh, of, of what this is, we end up not having any, any problems. You know, and the last thing you want in softball is drama, all right, or misunderstandings. So ever since we started doing that, it's been super successful uh, because this is not what this is not what you were doing. This isn't you trip ball or going and playing for you know trophy tournaments and stuff. What you're trying to do now is you're in a smaller world with a lot bigger connections, and and that world is only in Kansas City. There's only a handful of teams doing doing this. Uh, Aces select, you know, Top Gun's got one or two teams, okay? Uh, it used to be the original was always doing this. But but the MO is to find the perfect puzzle piece for your kid to go play softball somewhere. A place that she's going to be successful, a place that she's going to go study and get her education in what she's interested in. And at the end of four years, and, and when we are recruiting kids, when kids come into M and U. I always make a point say this, that if you're going to come here, we want to make sure that if you sign with us at the end of that four years, you're going to say that was time well spent. I am glad I did that. That was a perfect fit for me. So for some of our kids, it might be D1 Pet. For some of our kids, it might be two. And for some of it, NAI. And even um, community college and then bouncing off somewhere. All right? So to understand and recognize that, you know, what, that is what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to be, able, you know, one of the top teams in the area uh, and helping your kids, you know, get their dreams realized or whatever. And so far, I know with the 18s, all of our kids are signed except for three. And, you know, we're 100% we're confident that those kids are going to do it. But it, it's not just our work. It's kind of a team or anything so like uh, you know kids and parents you, you need to understand that you have to be an advocate to help your kid get recruited and for some people you know that's they know that's what they want to do but they don't always know what the process or the steps are does that make sense and, and feel free to ask questions you know during this at any time okay so you know one of the things that that's important, and this is where you know Coach Wade comes in hand. Our teams need to be in the tournaments where the college people are out recruiting. Okay, you can go play a lot of softball, but 
if, if the people that need to see you aren't there, you're just playing softball. Does that make sense? Okay, and then, you know, the other thing we, we talk about kids coming in, it really is not about playing time. It, it really isn't. Whether you play all every single inning of, of the game or you just play one, it's really not about playing time. It's about player development. So, like, when you start doing this, okay, it is, it is really important that practice, you get better with practice. Practice, practice, practice. And then when you are there playing in a game and a coach is there to watch you, the next step is you practice well enough that you're going to be able to perform, that they're like, start putting you on a list. Does that make sense, ladies? Okay, so, so that's what you're working for. If, if you're not doing that, you're, you're just out there kind of hoping. So this goes into part of the recruiting plan. You got to have a plan just like you would if you're going up the bat. It, it has to be a plan that, that's going to go there. Uh, you know, part of our recruiting thing, the way the rules have changed now, uh, camps are super important now. D1 people can't talk to you till your, uh, what is it, your fall season, your junior year now. So they might be interested in you, but they have very limited contact. So they might be there watching you down at Tulsa, and wow, man, Allie just had a dinner. But he can't say anything to you because it's against the rules. And you can't say anything to your travel coach either. No. So D1 coaches can't, say pretend I was a D1 coach and I was interested in your kid. The old way it was that I'd go to the travel ball coach and I'd say, hey, I really like this kid. I could see her fitting in in our program. When do you think you might get her on campus, either for a camp or a visit? But that's gone now. And that's why the early recruiting is going to start to go away. It's going to take a while for all of this to kind of reset itself. But in the past, we had a lot of free reign in talking to travel ball coaches who were the intermediary, intermediary between the players and the college coaches. That's all gone now. Is it still happening? Yes. I'm not going to sit here and tell you everybody's at the corner, everybody's got a lot of character because they don't. Um, they still do it. But now if there is a rule in place that they can get punished for it. And so they, know, they understand now that the more I get punished for these rules, the more it gets on my record and the less chance I have to get another job somewhere because I've been, I've been kind of deemed as a coach that cheats. So at the D1 level, it's so much harder now for them to do that because they can't even go when you're on their campus. It used to be in the past when you went to their campus for a camp or a visit, they could talk to you freely about everything. Where you fit in their program, what they see you doing when you get here, like I'm looking at you maybe to be my number one pitcher or, or maybe you know you're gonna be our catcher. They were able to do that then at the D1 level. Now they can't. They, they have to watch what they say. So that's why it's really hard for these coaches now to, as, it, as, this, as this change starts to take place, that to understand that their words matter. And so now when, even when you're on a camp, they can't go to your parents like they could in the past and say, hey, I really like your kid, I'd like her to come here, uh, and, and tell the kid the same thing, and make a verbal offer, um, which is why you saw the early recruits and the early verbally in the past. They can't do that anymore. Now, they can still that, do that at D2, and they can still do that at uh, NAI. Um, D3 doesn't offer athletic scholarships, so it doesn't matter. They only have offer a full um, academic packages. That whether you know it's, it covers it all or not, it's up based on your grades and your performance. So that's why it's so important as a parent, as Mark said, to be an advocate now, um, because you have to in this process you have to you have to take and say take Bailey here, who what grade are you in Bailey, a freshman? Yeah. Hey, who's the youngest one here? Greater you. So now she's she's entering this world of travel softball that you know she's starting to learn more every day. They see these things. They say, okay, man, this kid already here. She's only a year older than me. She's already got she's already verbal to go to Kentucky or Arizona State or something like that. What about me? And so what your job is now is to make them understand that it's gone back to the old way now, where they're going to watch you and evaluate you now until you're a junior in high school. And the more that they come and watch you is going to be your guide to how interested, how interested they are in you. Okay, So 
you can't say anymore that they're just going to say we're going to offer this kid. I had my last year was what two seasons ago. Yeah. I had a seventh grader pitching for me. Okay, six foot tall, threw about 64, 65 consistently. Had Mike Andrea, Arizona, and all of our things, Oklahoma. They all wanted to offer. They're texting me all hours of the night about a seventh grader. It's, it was ridiculous, you know. And who knows what this kid's going to be by the time she gets to high school? We don't know this. So. That stuff is gone, which I'm very happy about because I don't think it's I don't think it's right. I came up, I was talking to Justin about this earlier. When the Zephyr started in the fall of '96, okay, there at that time there were there were some other teams. Obviously, there is every year, but the three long-standing programs that still have teams playing in Kansas City are the Peppers, the Originals, and the Zephyrs. Peppers started in the late '80s. Earl started the originals probably in the mid 90s, like 94 or something like that, I think. And then we started in the fall of 96. And we still have teams to this day. So we've seen up, we've seen it all. And I joke with people all the time and tell them, say, when I first started coaching travel ball, the ball was white. Yeah. So that, that's a long time ago, right? So we've seen it all. And I've seen what this used to be like. It used to be like, Somewhat like what uh, Division One football is like, where they would make in-home visits. Coaches back when my daughter was playing in, in high school, they would set up appointments once after your, your child reached their uh, the fall of their junior year. They would see if they could come have dinner at your house, and they would sit down and recruit that way. And they're recruiting kids that are going to be seniors in high school, which to me is a proper way to do it because so many times we see kids that are your age, great athlete. Now we don't know what's going to happen to you in four years, five years. Your, 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 your needs, your, your interests, um, your body, a lot of things change. And so we don't know. So basically they were taking a gamble and I'm glad that's gone. Now they want to watch you. And so now you can, you can sit back and say, okay, good. I can work on my game now. I can work on being the best player I can be so that way when I get on the field, that coach is going to see me every single time and know what they're getting. And that to me is the biggest change in this whole thing. And so that's why it's important for parents to make sure that you help counsel your kids now through this because you're, we're just now getting through the end and it's, I, th I think we're gonna probably go another six months to maybe a year of, of flushing out all the early verbal stuff and then you're gonna see a, a, a shift back to where it used to be. So we're kind of in a transition period, but you just have to make sure they understand. Two, the, the three important things, be calm, okay, be patient, train, and compete, okay, training, like Mark said, practice to us is more important than games. At this level, as a travel ball coach, your goal should be have the greatest practices you can have. You should have the greatest practices. You should be all about develop, developing your players because now I'm going to take a kid and develop her into a good player that a coach is going to like by the time she's a junior in high school because I have time to do that now if they stick with you. Um, and to compete. And compete as a college coach and uh, having a great network with Division One coaches over the years, and, and some of them are actually friends of mine. We all think the same, whether it's NAIA or JUCO or NAIA or D3. I want a player who has played a high caliber of competition consistently. I want to know that when I put them in the fire against another team that's loaded with 22 and 23 year old women, that this kid is going to be able to hold her own. She's not going to do that by just playing local every weekend. I'm going to tell you that right now. It doesn't happen. You have to go and put yourself out there. You have to go and play the best teams that you can be. You have to get beat sometimes. But in order to get better, you have to check. You have to take that chance. If you don't take that chance, you're just going to stay the same all the time. I can tell you again, as 100% as a coach, I would if if I was recruiting player A and player B. Player A lives in Kansas City, and player A plays USSA tournaments only, and they don't go to a, a major national tournament. They go to the USA Elite thing, and they say, that's it, we're done for the year. And I've got a kid in California who plays every month of the year except for December, and they're playing in national tournaments and national qualifiers against other great teams, not just exposure tournaments, not just Colorados or Top Guns. I'm talking about qualifiers, where you win, you lose or you win if you want to go to nationals to play with the best of the best. I want kids who can go to PGF, I want kids who can go to ASA, and, and I want those kids that compete on the last day of the tournament. If those kids are on those teams, 
then I'm going to be more at ease about this kid getting on the field for me, knowing that this kid is going to perform under pressure. Because I can tell you right now, and Mark, Mark kind of experienced this too the last two years here, is that it's different. It doesn't matter what level it is. If it's NAIA, if it's high school, if it's you know JUCO or D1, college softball is different. And like I said, you know we have kids that are coming in that are 19, 18, 19 years old, and they've got to compete with a 22-year-old woman who's been in the weight room for four years it's different. To, it's not fair. to get on the field. How do you make a kid who doesn't go out and, and put themselves out there and try and be competitive in the hardest tournaments up against that and think that they're going to be okay? Because I want a kid who's going to be good, pretty good for four years instead of one that's only going to be good for one year. And that's the whole development thing. Sometimes we'll take kids on a developmental basis knowing that they're, they're going to be happy with not getting a lot of good playing time until they earn it. But that kid's going to keep going in an upward arc as far as her skills go, and she's going to get better. So that's why I want to really, uh, I, I wanted to emphasize on that before Mark started talking, uh, started talking about it, is how important that is going to play in these national tournaments and going to, and getting in that mix. Um, our first year out in gold, um, we jumped right from 16s to 1800 gold back then. They didn't have premier. Um, it was tough. I mean, I thought I knew softball. I mean, these coaches were laughing. I mean, because it's a lesson. Our first national qualifier, we're like, man, we're going to go to Arizona. Phoenix to a national qualifier. So we got on a plane, everybody flew out to Phoenix to a national qualifier. We drew some team called the SoCal Jets. Okay? Anybody heard of the SoCal Jets? You've heard of SoCal Jets? Really? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> they don't exist anymore. But they did for a long time back in the day. They weren't one of the top level teams. They weren't the Firecrackers, they weren't the Crony Angels, they weren't Gordon's Panthers, and they weren't uh, the Bat Busters. Okay? They were a lower level team. So I'm like, man, we got a good draw. We show up, at that time, you could still play college girls if they had age eligibility. Their whole team was kids coming back from their freshman year of college. They beat us like 15 to nothing. And we're just like, wow, this is incredible. So it, what it does is it doesn't make you quit, it makes you get tougher, it makes you grow. Two years later, we go, we get an opportunity to play on the main fields at the, at the Thanksgiving tournament in Surf City. City. Yeah, Surf City Tournament. And we get the toughest draw in the tournament. Because at that time, Christy Ambrosi was on my coaching staff, and she had a lot of connections out there. And so she knew Gary Hanning, who started the Bat Busters. And so they've had a long-time relationship. So just, Gary's, uh, Gary's like, yeah, I'll put you in our pool. We're playing on the one field the whole time, and we're playing Bat Busters, Cruisers, American Pastime. We're playing all the big teams, okay? We beat. The Bat Busters, three to one, okay? With a bunch of girls from here, the only way that we did that is by going out and losing 15 to nothing to the Jets at one time and understanding where we have to be as a team. And then our kids got better and they started to get better. And then when we started beating teams, then they started putting you on the main fields consistently. That's why to this day, you know, I can call up PGF or, or text one of my friends there and say, hey, can I get a berth for one of my teams? It's not a 100% guaranteed deal, but usually we get it. You know, we get an invitation to the Gold Cup, the ASA Gold Cup every year um, to go play in that, which is the, a level above all their nationals. And I've turned it down because I didn't want to, I was loyal to PGF. These guys are going to do it this year, which I'm happy they're going to go do. We turned around and did it back to back with PGF last year. Yeah. And so that's the importance of playing these good teams at these good tournaments is preparing, not only just preparing your kids for getting recruited and making them better, but preparing them to be able to play when they get into college. Because I think everybody that goes to college and plays softball wants to get on the field occasionally. I mean, I see them every day. They want to play. I mean, and I feel bad for the ones that can't get on the field, but you know what, they know just as well as I do, they didn't earn it. You know, they haven't beat anybody out. So I, I, I want to make sure that with, in, in our organization, you guys understand that it starts at this level. It starts at the ground floor. These, these are the times that you guys need to make sure that you put your kids in these situations. Is it okay to play multiple sports? Absolutely. Love it. Love athletes. Is it okay to miss, some, miss a practice occasionally? I don't care. As long as it's something that's family related or it's school related, it's fine. Because you're not going to be a softball player your whole life. But when you go to practice and play, and you go to play, play the good teams. Play in the good tournaments. Make it worthwhile. 
costs the same amount of money to enter one national tournament as it does another. Is travel different? Yeah, but you know that's why they call it travel ball. It's not like travel from here to Baser or from here to Springfield. You know, it, travel ball back in the day was coast to coast. I'm not saying that's for everybody, but I'm just saying that you need to expand your horizons a little bit and understand that that's what being part of a great organization that has this kind of aura about it that is what it's all about. And, you know, if you have concerns about travel and, and things like that, uh, you know, fundraising, this was the biggest obstacle as me having to get over for, for my own kid because my first thought, I just want to do this younger, and when we're 14s or 12s or whatever, I was like, we, we, don't, we don't need to go to California. I didn't drink the Kool-Aid. Tell them what the pat, the patent line is out here that everybody's going to tell you. My about. kid does not want to go to college on the West Coast. Oh, my kid doesn't want to go to college in the Southeast. My kid doesn't want to go to college in the Northeast. <clears throat> Every kid we take to California, 90% of those kids got recruited by a school locally in, in California. California. So, yeah. For the very reason I told you is that they want to see what this kid does against better teams. Yeah, and I sent care with Rob's team on California. I came back like we, from now on, just now I'm strong. We, we got to do this. Uh, all the college coaches are there. That That's the pond that they go around to, to see. And then the Tulsa <laughs> tournament. So, so it's really, really important about what tournaments that, that we're playing in, okay? And, you know, we've already created that network. So, yeah, I don't know if my kid wants to go play at that school or whatever. Well, you never know. So we would like to thank Always Big. And if it ends up right back here, awesome. But, but like I said, the, the purpose is find someone out there that's going to be a great fit for you, so you can play softball, get a great education, and you're going to have a great experience. And find someone that's wanting to throw money at you so you can say yes. Okay? If you only think small, man, there's only so many opportunities here. And look at all the competition. Because these local schools, just like us, we're recruiting nationally, not just locally. We're looking for kids everywhere. And the other thing with the, the Zephyrs, it, we, I really feel what we want to do is prepare our kids through the process, 14, 16, 18, so that when you do show up, you make an impact in that program almost immediately. Does that make sense? Because you're prepared. And you come in and you start, all of a sudden, boom, making an impact. All right? That, that's the purpose. We do have 22, year, 22 girls on our roster here at MNU. All 22 want to play. <coughs> okay, but, but you guys know that that's not it. Are they all important? Yes. They are all still very important. So, you know, and some of them have to work through. Some of them come in and bang. This girl's won me on the field for four years. Okay, so, you know, it, it's going to be different for everybody. The process also is different for everybody. So, this is the, the, the thing. So like with the four teams, this is where you, you're getting out, you're getting a good team, you're competing in these top tournaments, you're, you're playing well so, so people can start seeing a kid, and then they want to start seeing their growth. Like I said, they might let you know, they might not let you know if they're on, on your list. It's really, really important that uh, as, as coaches that we have a liaison to start passing out the, the recruiting sheets and, and finding out. Okay, because like like uh, Coach said, you know, D2s and AIs can all talk to you all the time pretty much. All right? And I would tell you also, man, if you can play at this D2, then why couldn't you go play at that D2 that might be farther? They might want to give you more money. Or uh, what about this mid-major D1? They might be interested. They were looking for your, your gear and your skill set anyway. Okay, so, so keep an open mind about this. And then at 16s, 16s is really kind of the, the year that your, your windows start opening up where they're really going to start to pay attention to you. I mean, and parents, I'm just going to tell you like this, and, and Tiffany will probably find out in, in June. <coughs> the recruiting process is stressful. I don't know if it's on purpose or what, but it is stressful. You're recruiting, you got to be sending out your emails constantly, okay? Even if, you know, you, you got to send out those, those emails, uh, go to the camps, make contact with that coach, 
so, so that you can get them to the game. You know, part of it is having a great network, but the other part of it is when you're at these tournaments, it is your job to get the coach there to watch you. Not us, not your parents, but, but the kids from emails. So if you go up to a tournament and there's nobody watching you, I would blame you. I know that sounds harsh, but I'll tell you what, did you send out your emails? And, and we went through this with uh, our last kids getting recruited did not email heavily, you know, till just recently. When, you know, all of a sudden, man, she's getting recruited, she's getting recruited. I mean, it's different for everybody, but it is... That is the way to, to get there and get them noticed. And when, when you say heavily, you're not talking just one email a month. You're, you're talking like pinging them like every week, every uh, couple weeks. Updates on tournaments. Yeah, updates. Yeah. This is a dead I time. Think, I, think, I, think, yeah. I think two or three times a month is fine. Two or three times a month, okay. Yeah. As long as you're showing that you're continuing. And this is why I, I wanted to interrupt Mark so I can add like a scenario here. Um, you guys, we, we have kind of a weird thing. I'm a head coach in a college. I'm recruiting players. I also have teams that play under me in, in the Zephyrs organization, some really good teams with some really good players. I'm not going to go out and actively recruit one of these kids unless they've shown some kind of interest in me. And most coaches want to know that you're interested in them because it's a two-way street. Now, there's obviously those one or two kids out there that you just can't live without. This kid throws 65. This kid hits the ball 300 feet. Well, everybody's going to compete for that kid, but that everybody wants it. The other good kids, it's really a bad mix if you're out there trying to talk a kid into coming to your school that you know good and well when she gets there, she's not going to like it. Yeah, she's, not gonna, she's not going to fit in. And so it has to be a two-way street. It has to be like, you know what, I think I'd like to play there. I don't understand why Coach Wade hasn't been contacting me. Well, Coach Wade doesn't know whether or not you want to play for him or not. <coughs> and so, that and use that with all the schools. And just replace Coach Wade with whatever coaches the other schools are. So that, guy, so that way you understand you know, how this works, why it is a, such a two-way street. It is important for you girls to figure out what you want to do with your life. Because softball, softball ends pretty quick. I mean, it does. I mean, it, don't get all sad about it now. You're still young. But there is, and I learned this hard my first year here. You know, I, I was at Avila for a couple of seasons, and I didn't, I didn't have a lot of seniors, so it didn't really matter. When I got here, it hit me. On that last day of the conference tournament when we got beat in extra innings and see the look on those seniors' faces when they knew that it was over, there's, there's something to that. It, 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 it struck me that this does go by very fast and it is important to them. But what makes it most important to them is that they know where they want to go. They know what they want to do. Now, is it, is it going to be a foolproof system? No, because kids change their minds all the time. But most kids have an idea of what they want to do. Find out if that school does that. If that school doesn't do it, then don't go play softball there, because softball's only for four years. You're going to have a job for 60 or 70 years of your life. You know, you're going to want to support your family. You're going to want to be an independent person. You're not going to have to want to depend on a man to pay for everything all the time. So it's important that you understand that I want to kind of have an idea of what I want to do. It doesn't have to be exact. Some kids know they want to be a teacher. Some kids know they want to be a nurse. Some kids know that they want to be a coach, you know, but have an idea, whether it's business, finance, the sports world, nursing, education, have an idea of what you want to do before you start with the massive emailing. Because yeah. if you're just massive emailing to get anybody to bite, that's the wrong way to go about it. You may get lucky, but the odds are that you've got, you're going about it the wrong way. Target the areas that you want to go. Target the level that you want to go. Like, don't be sending stuff to Arizona if you know that you're not a good enough player to play at Arizona. And if you don't know that you're not a good enough player to go to Arizona, ask me and I'll tell you. <clears throat> I'm just saying. So, you know, these are the things that you really need to figure out is, as a player, is what do you want to do? How far can you live away from home? I had a recruit from Arizona that I verbaled two years ago, or a year and a half ago, and she's a 19. <coughs> Letter of intent went out um, in November, and I didn't get hers back, and I didn't get hers back, and I didn't get hers back, and then I get this text saying, Coach, I'm afraid I can't live that far from, away from home. I changed my mind. I'm going to stay in town. I'm fine with that. At least I know now that she doesn't want to go there. <coughs> Would I have rather wasted my time or spent better time recruiting somebody else 
Sure, but you know what? I still have that scholarship money available to go find a kid who wants to be here. And so that's the biggest thing is find out where you want to be. You know, some kids can't live farther than two hours away from home. They just okay. can't do it. And that's fine. Okay. Some kids want to live on the other side of the country. And I've had kids that do that. And, you know, but th that's a smaller number of kids than the ones that want to stay close to their family. So that's an important thing that you guys need to, to really take into consideration when you're starting to look at schools and sending out emails and targeting things. Also, this, before I sit back down and let these guys talk. Just because this is your kids, you know, whether it's CMU or Northwest Missouri or Mo Valley or Avila or MNU, we don't have room for everybody. And so you may want to go to Central Methodist, or you may want to go to Central Missouri, or you may want to go somewhere, you know, it's local, Pittsburgh State. Pittsburgh State might be recruiting kids in Texas. So you need to find out. And how do you find out? Go to their camp. Go to their camp and then see if you can get a chance to talk to the coach and find out. Find out, have, have somebody call the coach and find out. That way you're not wasting your time and your energy and get, getting all your hopes up that I, this is where I want to go to school. I'm going to put all my eggs in this basket. That's a very, very bad plan. And, and that's kind of where I come in. So, so if you're not, if you don't know, uh, contact me so, so I can reach out for, for your kids. So, so we're going to be selective in what, the, like I said, the email, but we don't want to have like a shotgun approach and just see if anybody will bite, okay? Uh, you know, and if you don't know what you want to do, that, that's completely fine. I would also tell you, if you're fine from playing five hours away, then you'd be fine playing ten hours away not a whole lot of difference for your parents okay so so the recruiting part with with our kids is you know the, the camps uh, you know having a well-constructed email being selective of who you're reaching out to and uh, you know part of the, the camp is do you like their coaches and stuff too you got to spend four years with, with these people and then talk to to the players too players are great as far as like telling you I mean, they're, they're kind of there working in camp. They kind of, you know, they're no, but there's always one that will give you everything inside scoop that you need to know if, if you would like it here. I had a kid, Mark, that came to our hitting camp last Saturday. He's already emailed me twice. Yeah. Between now, last Saturday and now. I mean, that kid wants to come here. But, uh, uh, so, so that's part of it. That's where we get into, like, the, the playing time, okay? So like if you're in a tournament or whatever, you know, cool play, this is where, you know, people start rotating in. And you can't get hung. I know it's really hard as parents get hung up on winning and losing. Winning is on Sunday. Because usually on Sunday, the coach is kind of cleared out. You know, so, so on Sunday, it's intended to play the best nine or ten. You know, sometimes we still go with roster, but, but to go as far as you can and try and win on Sunday is, is really important. That, that competitive nature. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it always works. Every once in a while you'll have a bad day and you're losing the first game. And some, some, some teams have a different philosophy about that. I know that I, I know teams that are very successful that their philosophy is when we get into bracket play, I'm trying to beat everybody. I'm yeah. playing my best nine and I'm throwing my best kid. I don't want to lose a game in bracket play with my best player on the bench. I'm not going to do it. And, you know, there's people that have that philosophy, and I think it's fine. That's their philosophy. And then there's people who are like, you know, they want to be more fair, and they want to give their kids more time and give them some, some chances to play in big situations. There's pluses for both sides. The one thing that you can't dispute is, is the longer you play in the tournament, the more chances you get to be seen. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is for players, too, and parents. You're not happy with kids playing time, ask. What do they need to get better at? How do I beat out that kid? Uh, but I would also warn you and, and tell you, if you get to the point where you are counting the number of innings compared to some other kid, you, you're missing the point. You, you're not getting it. If you're counting how many at bats she had compared to yours, it, you're focusing on the wrong stuff. That, that's not player development. That's not making your kid better or anything. You, you're, you're, you're watching the wrong thing. Everybody's kid's going to make mistakes. Okay, uh, that's just it, you know. Drop fly ball in the outfield happens. Strike out with bases loaded and winning run at third happens. Uh, 
fall forward because all of a sudden she's struggling. It happens. Okay? So, so you know, the focus needs to be on getting better. All right? And think about it in the long run. You, you, if you do commit somewhere for four years, like, hey, I'm coming here to MNU. And all of a sudden you're not happy about your playing time or whatever, you're just going to pack up and change colleges? Well, it just doesn't work that way. It's really, really hard. Kids do. I don't always think it's great. It's good. Sometimes it's for the better. But, but I mean, this tough attitude, it's like, I'm going to work to get better. And if, if it does, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But it's really, really important <coughs> to be an advocate for yourself. What do I need to get better at? Even if you are playing every stinking moment of every game, what do I need to get better at? Because there will always be someone out there better than you. And when you're, you're going to be there, she, she's going to beat you. It's going to be okay. But it, but it teaches a good lesson, okay? That, that you got to always, this growth mindset, i got to get better. i got to get better. i got to get better. Does that make sense? Okay? And so, so we're always just working. And for some kids, the, the curve is steep. For other kids, it's a slow, steady climb. And this is the other struggle, parent, that, that, you know, for the 14s and 16s. All of a sudden, kids are going to start signing and getting committed and stuff. And it might not be your kid yet. And don't worry. Just, just trust the process, you know. Like, well, holy smokes. She, my kid bats 400. She's only bat like 350. But, I mean, they, don't, don't compare. You're comparing apples and oranges. The process and it's different for everyone. Think about like math class. Every kid learns math at a different pace, even though every school and every teacher wants you all to learn it at the same thing so that we can keep moving on. All right? You have to be patient with your own progress. Does that make sense? So some kids are going to get signed early, some are going to be late. But the purpose, what you'd be focusing on, is finding the right place for you, that you're going to be successful, that you're going to get to play softball, and you're going to make a difference, you're going to enjoy it for four years, and you're going to get a great education. That, that is the long-term focus. And I know sometimes on Sundays when things happen, we get a little upset, you know, but, but you know, step back. Learn to step back. And then parents also, as you start getting recruiting, you know, teams that start, coaches start following uh, the team or whatever, they're, they're watching you. You're under a microscope whether you know it or not. And we'll, I'll recruit a parent as hard as I'll recruit a player. You know, as far as evaluation, I'm going to sit and watch a, a parent probably a little bit more after I've shown it. After I found out that I'm interested in this kid, now I'm going to find out if her, I can deal with her parents or if what her parents are doing with her is going to be something that when she comes to play for me is going to fit. So college coaches watch parents. They will, they, will, they will intentionally sometimes either set right against the money so they can do what you're saying, or they just sit somewhere off in the distance so they can watch you. If they're interested in your kid, they're interested in you. And your social They're going to watch everything you do. And if you've got bad body language about a game, that's a check mark against you and against your kid. No matter how good she is, I'm just telling you now, honestly, it's a check mark against you. If you're yelling at the umpire all the time and getting warned, Stop it. coaches don't Stop want to it. deal with that. It's not about you. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole thing you got to understand. It's not about you. It's hard. I know as a softball parent, too, I know it's hard. But I was lucky because I was a coach, too, and I didn't coach my own daughters on my travel team. And I knew that why I didn't want to coach them on my own travel team, because I knew they wouldn't like it, and we would hate each other. <laughs> So it worked for me that way, but I, I, I've, I've seen it so many times. I just need you to understand that the parents' role in this is huge. You know, they they trust mean, genetics, people. Can you hear me real quick? Yeah. So um, I'm Justin, by the way. Um, on, on the same token, what he's saying, um, I've had our, our group together now since the uh, last one of seven years. Uh, we've changed a few players here and there. But my main focus to get them there was the parents. Because if, if I can't get the parents on board with what we're trying to do, then we're going to have a high turnover, and we're going to start the process over every year. And then we don't get any better. Then we don't get progress if we keep the same kids coming in who already learned what we're trying to teach them. 
That's why when we get to them, they're set with the tools they need. So on our team, we just added um, Lauren Eisenreich as a coach uh, to our staff. She coaches at Blue Springs High School, played at Missouri State. Uh, her father was a royal and everything. And she came to observe our practice with uh, the 14s and the 18s. And she just came up to me and she said, and our high, team, high school team really sucked, didn't they? And I was like, well, uh, they've been, she just it was an amazement of how, how good you guys had your basic fundamentals down, your routines. Like, we didn't have to tell you anything. You guys just go to work and knew what you had to do. Now, on the same note, she sees the people that go half ass on that. And, 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 and so do they. So when, when we try to get the parents involved, we, we need to make sure that you understand that we're the coaches. We may not always make the right decision out there. We're trying to. We are, we are human. We will fault. We'll be the first ones to admit it to our girls, though. And every team probably has their own philosophy on how they handle you know, unhappy playing time. But I, I ask my girls to come up to me first. If I can't settle it with the girls on how our relationship is, then we need to work on that first. Then I, I, if I can't get to that, then I ask the parents, hey, then maybe we need to step and have a, a group talk. But we know, because the coaching staff, we talk about it all the time. So we know where your girls are at, at least in our eyes. Right? And, and it's hard to have parent glasses on. Use my kid's the best. I know she belongs out there. She may belong out there. On another team, she may be the star player. On her college, she may not be the star player. She may have to work just as hard to get on that team, on the field. We just tell them, is your goal to play in college or is your goal to play in a game on the weekend? Most of them is to play in college. So that route doesn't always include playing every inning of every game. You're getting better, you're getting more reps in our practice. You may get 100 balls at practice, in the game you get two, and you may strike out twice. So how good did you get because you played that weekend? And, and the, the, the kid talking to the coach, I, I can't stress to you enough how important it is that the kid initiates the conversation and the kid is bought into the conversation. They weren't coerced into going to talk to a coach because a parent made him do it. Because in college, uh, for instance, two years ago, I had a transfer kid from uh, California. And she, was, she, was, she had a big arm. She was a catcher who could really throw. She had like a 175 pop time. But she had bad knees, she couldn't block, and she wasn't a very good hitter. Well, I treated her the same way I treat everybody else. I treat, I treat all my players with respect and love. Um, we're just trying to coach her up to get her to play better. Well, she was splitting time with another kid who was in the same grade who was probably equally talented. There wasn't really much difference there. Well, she goes to the athletic director to sit down, tries to get in the, she goes to the athletic director to get an appointment to sit down and talk to him because she's mad at me because she's not playing enough. My athletic director looked her right in the eye and says, did you talk to your coach about this yet? She went, nope, and he goes, I suggest you talk to him first before you come to me. You know, and that's exactly what's gonna happen. You know, that's why it's important to have these kids initiate those conversations, you know, with the coaches. So that way they can build a rapport. That's, you know, that's the only way your kid's ever going to be successful with a certain coach is if they have a rapport. If they can, if they can understand each other, and sometimes they're not always going to agree, but if they understand that we both have the same motives in mind and we're trying to get to the same place, then that, that it, it's going to work. But that's never going to happen if they don't talk. And so that communication is a big part of that. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Um, so you might have questions on the, the recruiting thing. Make sure we're, we've got a well-constructed email. So we're going camp. Yes, sir. Uh, what, about, what about the use of Twitter? So, so like recruiting. Prefer that. In social media, ladies, you need, you need to be cautious with it. If you're interested in playing the next level, you can't be like, just blasting craziness out there. That, that'll get you written off. You mean as far as recruiting though, right? Correct, like yeah, the, the awesome child like communicating with the yeah. you know the coach. Uh, it's, it's it's kind of a mixed bag right now because it's still fairly new in the in the recruiting world. You can send it, but they probably won't reply back. Yeah, I mean they obviously can't they can't like it because that would be a recruiting violation, believe it or not. Okay. But they'll see it. Yeah. Now, sitting in rooms with these coaches when I'm working their camps during the summer and hearing them talk about it, sometimes it's kind of a joke to them. They're like, man, this kid tweets at me like three times a day okay. and and so you got to be careful about how much you do it 
And also be careful that you're, you're, you're putting it towards an appropriate level. Like if you don't know if your kid's skill video that you're, she's gonna put on there is good enough to be sent into a division one team, ask somebody. Because it's kind of embarrassing because then they're gonna get these and they're just gonna go, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't play for me. And it's nothing negative, it's just that you're, you're trying to go to the wrong level. And you may get shut off before they even see you playing the game yeah. just because of your basic fundamentals you showed on Twitter. Well, yes. Marty Tyson always told me, and this is the one thing when we, when we first started, is that you never get a second chance at a first impression. That first impression the coach gets to you, it's really, really hard for them to change that impression. It, it sticks. It's, it's, it sticks to everything. It's like mm -hmm. peanut butter. And that, that first impression is really, really hard to change. So if you have a bad first impression with the coach, it's going to take a long time to change it. And that's just human nature, and that's the way the mind works. So it's always good to make sure that you have, you know, you're, you're at the top of your behavior, the top of your game, all the time, because one little slip, that could be somebody's first impression of you. Ladies. The pressure. Mark, I want to say one thing. Um, so just this is more for the coaches and just the girls, just from experience from the last few years. So, you know, we really tried real hard to get our girls recruited. Um, and we probably put a lot of extra stress on the girls um, more than anybody to, to succeed when they're in front of those coaches. Um, we started noticing when we got to those big tournaments, the girls would all tense up, tense up and make errors like they wouldn't used to do. And before you know it, they had bad outings in front of great coaches and great schools. Like you said, you never get a second chance. So I mean, there was two years in a row, we literally shut down I don't, I don't want you emailing coaches. I don't want to hear about a coach. I don't care who's out there. I'm not putting up my recruiting sheets until we can get back on playing softball. Because you'll get caught up in it. You get caught up while so and so's getting looked at. And they may ask a pitcher to pitch, you know, three times back to back. Why she get to pitch again? And it started causing tension within the team. If, if, and if we didn't address it, it, it could make your team explode. So we had to really take a step back and just slow it down you guys will get recruited if you're doing the things that you need to do and i was lucky with that um just because i had my wife there at a lot of the stuff yeah. until the last couple of years of doing it because she was dumb <laughs> uh was that if a coach ca coaches when she would talk to the college coaches because she had no relationship to any of the players she was my wife so she was our liaison so she was the one that's talking to all the college coaches during games when i was coaching and she would bring me information over saying hey this coach would like to see this kid play Okay, that's great. I'll put this kid in the game at this certain time. She would go relay that information. Now she would also kind of relay that information to the parent of the kid whose place she's gonna take on the field. So they understand ahead of time that, hey, coach wants to see this kid play here. It's nothing against your daughter. This coach is, she, we're gonna pull her out and swap him out. We do the same thing for your girl. Anytime the coach comes and wants to see her in the game. Um, so that that's, all comes back to the communication piece. We have to make sure that we're communicating. I know not everybody has liaisons. I think it's something that you really need to find somebody to do it that's um, genuine, that's easy to talk to. I've been lucky because I've had two uh, in my whole life. And Brandon Ewart was probably the best, and and my wife doing this, and they were they're awesome people. They're easy to talk to, and coaches enjoy talking to them. As a matter of fact, there's college coaches that still ask me how my wife's doing, and you know they haven't seen her in five, six, seven years. You know, so it's important to find somebody like that, not somebody that's a salesman. I hate as a coach going up there and as a used car salesman trying to sell me a player. I can't stand it. I have my own eyes. I know what I'm looking at. I want. I just need information, okay? And, and I don't need this. What are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for somebody to start at UCLA but wants to play at MNU. I'm going to start telling them that, you know? Got that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that's, you know, that's a big thing is have somebody can do that because it is important. Um, Funny story, we were playing in Surf City, and we are playing on, at, at uh, Huntington Beach, and we were playing the SoCal Athletics, and Mike Andrea happened, and his wife happened to come and sit in the, behind the backstop at our game. Mike Andrea, everybody know who he is? Head coach at Arizona, like nine or 10 national championships or whatever. Was the Olympic gold medal coach. I saw him, and I was like, oh my God, Mike Andrea's at our game. You know, this is incredible. And so, Brent, our, our chatty Kathy, the recruiting coordinator, didn't see him. And two or three innings go by, and I'm waiting for Brent to go over there and talk to him. You know, hey, hit him up. 
He never did. So I see him get up. I'm coaching third. I see Cam Dre get up and start walking. And, and at Huntington Beach, you have these big, long sidewalks to go around the whole complex. So he was walking down to go to another set of fields, him and his wife. They were probably 100 yards away. And I told Brent, I said, do you know who that was? And he goes, no. And I told him, he went at a dead sprint down that sidewalk and stopped them. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be embarrassing. Our game kept going on, and I kept coaching. Two or three more innings went by. He's out there talking. I could see him laughing and joking out there with him. We didn't have any kid that could play in Arizona. None. But he enjoyed having that conversation with that person. And if you can get that type of person out there that they can enjoy having a conversation with, then that's half the battle. You know, so it's it's just something to think about with your teams. Make sure you try to put that piece in place. It's a big piece. Yeah. But like I said, you, you just don't know it's coming yet, especially with the sixteens. So so it's like really, really important that uh, during that heavy recruiting part, it, it, this important thing is you gotta be able to perform. You have to be able to perform when when they're there. So you don't need to be worried about if you emailed him or, or not. It's when you're playing, it's being in the moment. You know, as an assistant coach for, for college, this is one of the frustrating things for, for getting 18 to 22 year old girls to, to just focus. They already signed to play college, okay? They, they've been practicing pretty hard, but getting to be good in the moment is still really, really difficult to perform at a, at a constant level, okay? And, and you know, this is where the practice comes in and for all you ladies. We, you don't need to be great, you just need to be consistently good. And then when you have a chance to be great, you, gotta be, you got a 50-50 chance. Sometimes, boom, you nail it, getting it for the game winner. Sometimes, boom, you don't, you strike out. Grandma still loves you, all right? but. But you'll still get another chance. But if you are consistently good, that people notice that. Okay? So so that needs to always be your focus. So like when you're on the on the field, that, that's the only thing you're you're worried about, just being consistently good. Sometimes the ball comes to you, sometimes it doesn't. But but when it does, you you, get, you gotta be ready. Alright? So so that's always kind of focus. And you know, parents in, in the stands, and it is starting to become more and more prevalent. And them watching you, you know, where's dad? He's in the outfield, or is dad behind the pen? If my daughter's pitching, was that really a strike? Okay, uh, you know, so this is kind of important. I would say the best thing you need to do as a parent is learn to cheer for everybody else's kid, and then when yours doesn't do well, ask her about the things that she did. She might strike out twice, but you know. She had a, hit a double, okay? Instead of always focusing on the negative. And this is what's really, really hard. We spend so much time with these kids that the only thing you see is their flaws instead of the other 90% of things that they're doing really well. And then as players, you guys forget, because you're comparing against other people of your equal ability, there are millions of kids out there that don't even know how to throw a softball. Okay, they, they really are. They, they come to camp or you go to high school. This is why I always think, especially as an old high school coach, where sometimes high school is frustrating for uh, top tier players because she's on varsity, but she can't hit a ball off the tee and she can barely throw up to second base the first. All right, but she's still on the team and she's still going to have to perform it and do well. She's still important. All right. So what we want is, you know, especially in high school, is if you're a good player, I always believe if you're a good player, you'll play well in high school too. Doesn't matter what the pitching is, you, you should actually elevate your game. People don't recruit high school ball though, because the, the skill level's too too wide. But doesn't mean you can't, still can't have a great experience. Does that make sense? So if you're a good ball player, it's really important for you to learn to make other people good too, here's not the, just to shine yourself. Here's the thing to think about high school pitching for you, your parents, your so kids going to face best. high school pitching. Hardest thing for us to do in college is to get a kid to hit an off-speed pitch. Everybody can hit the gas. Don't think your kid's not going to be able to hit fastball you know, when she goes back over to travel. Yes, there'll be some adjustment, 
but it just doesn't take as long as it tries to take it, that it takes to try to get a kid to stay back and get a change up. So every time that they're playing against a slow pitcher should be change up practice. You know, and, and you gotta look at it that way. And I'm trying to hit the ball in the middle of the field or opposite field, and I'm trying to blast it every time if it's a strike. You know, and just getting your timing down. So, you know, that's you have to look at those things in context. You know, you you'll some of you girls playing pretty good. You know, we're a state champion here, right? How many? Did you, did you, really? They're going to play some good players. There's just fortune. She goes to a high school that does that. But not everybody's high school does that. I said, they'll go play some kids that throw, you know, 53, 52, 48, you know? Just just use it as use it as a, as a as a learning tool. Have fun with it. Uh, I want to make sure we, we covered the importance of be patient with your kid's progress. Okay? Help her get back. This is just my own personal thing. I really don't believe you need to go spend tons of money for a batting coach or or recruiter or anything. We, we're we're already right here to give you everything you need. You, you get it. All a kid really needs instead of someone that you're going to pay uh, forty five dollars for thirty minutes to is you just need a space. Get that girl a tee, record her, and make sure it's thing and send send it to your high school coach or not your high school but the one of us. How many people do you pay that they don't come and watch you actually play? You take lessons from them, but they don't see you what you do in a game. You, know, you can have perfect swing form, but get up into a game and go 0 for 3, 0 for 4, 0 for 3, oh, a little 1 for 4, a little dink or two to the pitcher or whatever. They, they, they don't come watching you. So, so it's really important that, uh, you know, if you're going to spend money, that you're getting your money's worth. If you're not seeing her get better in games after, you know, 82 lessons and $40 a piece, and her swing is still the same and she still does the same thing, I would reconsider that. Well, well I don't spend a lot of money and this kid didn't get any better. Hmm. Can I touch same on thing goes to pitching. Can I touch on the recruiting service thing really quick? Oh, uh, yeah. That's a, that's Here's my opinion on recruiting services. Um, I use them as a college coach, but I don't recruit probably maybe 5% of kids from a recruiting service. Of maybe 5% of the kids on my roster I've met through a recruiting service. Um, so I, I'm just going to be real honest with you. Recruiting service is fine for if, if you just don't feel like you're going to have enough time to do it. If you're lazy, and I don't mean this derogatory, if you're lazy or you're too busy and you don't want to feel like doing this, then that's probably a good time to get a recruiting service. But if you're just diligent enough to maybe send help your kid compose and send out two leg you know, legible emails a week and attach some videos and those type of things, and then have a list, have a spreadsheet built up saying, okay, this is, these are my top 20 schools, these are my next 20 schools, and these are my next 20 schools. And then you know you have a targeted thing that you're gonna go after and just start sending them stuff. You know, out of those 60 schools, just start sending them stuff. You're gonna, you don't need a recruiting service because it, it's it's a it's a business yes but those people make a lot of money and they don't get a, a lot as many kids signed as you think you know a lot of us a lot of those kids that out of those recruiting services I'm gonna be honest with you like the NCSA and stuff like that a lot of them wind up playing JV in some of our schools that have JVs take that money get your ACT score up because yes. ACT a higher score equates to more educational money. All right, you might find a school that you love, say like at, at our level, and it, it's it's not cheap to go here, and, and we understand that. But if you got a 23 on your ACT, we know that we can give you this athletic money, and then we can tack on this. Where holy smokes, you get that's 80 percent of your college tuition right there. And yeah, we look at smart pays. Look at GPA. Smart we look at GPA, pays. ACT or SAT, SAT class scores, rank. and class rank. So if you're if you're if you're pretty low in one of those two, but you're like number five in your class, it may trump one of those. Depending on the schools, each school has their own way and method of doing it. Don't think that they're all the same. Their 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 matrix. Everybody's matrix is different on, based on you know where those things fall in the matrix table on how much money the kid's going to get. <clears throat> the only thing you need to worry about is keeping your GPA up and get a good ACT or SAT score. And when I say good, I mean it's gotta be over a 20. And 20's, 
20 is marginal. 20 is the average. Yeah, I would I would say you know if you can get it up you know 23 or 24. Now understand that at a certain point you're gonna you're gonna stop getting more money for it. I mean I think 26 I think is where they stop giving you more money. Um, so you know when you're in that area, if you want to strive for a perfect ACT score, that's great, and that opens a lot of academic doors for you. But as for softball related purposes, you know try to get over a 20, and if your kid can't get over a 20, 22, something like that. Take that money that you're going to use for recruiting service or hitting lessons and send them to Silver. You can, take, you can keep taking that test, but get yeah. better scores. <laughs> my, my, my daughter is a prime three. example. She uh, she didn't do too so, too hot her first ACT test. Um, you know, she got a 17 her first her first effort, and she knew she wasn't happy with it. She came back around um, in her junior year or senior year and got a 25. Ooh. So that's. Audrey Grunt? <laughs> Man, so it's awesome. And, she, and she's another one who was worrying forever. You know, she's not going to do this, not going to get recruited. And it, and it happened for her. And, you know, it's a lot of pressure to put on them. But get that ACT done, at least so you know where you stand and what you need to work on. Because you guys over here, you guys are still young, but you know, the 16, you guys are right there. You, have you taken your ACTs yet? Mm -hmm. No, yet. Sure. Mm -hmm. I know Kelly, your dad will make you over there. But get it done, get a test so you can know how you need to improve. Because I, I guarantee you, you see all these girls recruiting on, on social media, they're not getting full rides. Don't let your <laughs> don't let your uh, uh, your schools tell you that you're too young to take the ACT because they will. And you know why they will? It's because they pay for one. And they don't want to pay for two or three. They only want to pay for one. Okay? So if you pay for it yourself, you can go take it anytime you want. Like $57 yeah. for a test. But if you want your school to pay for it, they're only probably going to let you take it once, maybe twice max. That's worth it. So just make sure that you know you take it as early as you want. That way you know where you're at. Am I going to have to really crush it for three or four years here so I can get the score that I need, or am I cool? Am I good? I'm already got like 28. I'm, I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so, so our goal, you know, in like I said, ever since we started doing parents meeting with, with our kids, and it's funny, we talk about these things like we were experts, but I know Justin and I, uh, the first time we did video and sent it out, and then we went back and looked at it, like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. Uh, you know, we, we, we've already fallen down on our face several, several times. times, more than we can probably count, and we're, we're just really happy now. So the recruiting part, the importance of, be patient with the process. And th this is a stressful thing. It, it really is. There's no way around it as far as like different things. So, so it's really important as an organization that, that we really create a good support system that, that you know and understand and that you have a person that you can go talk to. Because if you don't know what always ends up happening, people fill in the blanks and it's always negative. If, if they don't communicate or reach out, Whatever they don't know, they fill it in with either the wrong material, the wrong person saying something, or just something just flat out negative. So, so we really want to, you know, kind of bring it in so, so people know what the process is, what we're trying to do, who to talk to, who's going to help me, how can they help me, and hopefully in the end we go through there. So our four teams, it's, it's real important that, hey, we, we start putting them out there, we start developing uh, the, the skills that college people are going to look at, okay? It, it's more than, you know, her arm strength or different things. All the little things that the college people look at for a good ball player for them. And then in the 16s, the, the recruiting, the same thing. Are you better than what you were in 14s? And then who you you reaching for, what, uh, what am I interested in, what would be a good fit for me, are we doing well, are we competing, uh, are we, and like I said, it's important to be in the right tournaments. Playing is just not enough. So this transition from my kid plays softball to my kid is a softball player is really, really important. And it takes a long time. A lot of kids play softball, okay, but as a college coach, we are looking for softball players. There's a 
it's a very subtle, but it's a very distinct distinction. And I, I see kids that are softball players, not just nine girls on the field. All right? And then we're looking for team players, too. Team players. And then your 18s. Hopefully you're signed or whatever. And then the process of... So the first hurdle's taken care of. Now you got the other 90% of what you're, what's actually going to happen once you're in college. <coughs> what you need to be prepared for. And because all you right know right now is like, I got to play softball in college. I got to play softball in college. But when they get here, it, it, that is only like 15% of the You may not game. play softball in college. Yeah. <laughs> you got to college, but you may not play in college. So like our focus with the 18s this year is refining our kids that have already committed where they're going to go, what they need to do to be able to make an impact there. Uh, because it does happen, it doesn't happen very often, but you could verbal early and then all of a sudden there's a change with the coaching staff or all of a sudden they found some other girl that they just fell in love with and they, they can decommit from you too. And it just happened. Yeah. Man, I, I haven't had a travel team in two, what, two, two seasons. Yeah, it's now. unfortunate. It's I had kids brutal. committed to Kansas, and when, with the coaching change, they just going in a early. different direction. They called her what, three days ago, a week ago, and said that we're going in a different direction. Good luck and bye. And she'd recruit, she she had verbal when she was a ninth grader. So she's a junior now, so all that time she was off the market. She was playing, playing for the Aces, she was playing on a high level team, but. As she passed up some offers that wanted her yeah. to switch too, right? Yeah, oh yeah. And uh, so now, I, just now I just got a text from mom. Do you know the Illinois coach? I mean, so now we're trying to find her another place to go. Um, you know, sometimes that early recruiting thing is, or coaching changes can really come back to bite you. That's why when you hear the cliche, don't pick a coach, okay, don't pick a... Don't pick a school, pick a school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just it's, make sure it's where you want to go to school. We have one example on that, our team, uh, Ba Bailey Bryant. So we went out to California, Surf City Tournament. Had the best weekend I think uh, she's ever had. Uh, St. Francis was out there, East Coast team. Um, Pennsylvania is 12 hours away. Yeah, didn't didn't uh, pick her up right off the bat. They, they had interest in her. She went to the camp, kind of ignored her. She didn't know where she stood. I don't know if they had a player drop or what. All of a sudden they come in February saying, hey, what happened to Bailey? We haven't heard from her. Well, Bailey thought you didn't have any interest in her. Um, well, she went back out there. They smoothed her. And, um, they offered her, you know, 80% out there, which is fantastic for her. third baseman was a 19 already. Um, and then her 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 coaches for St. Francis just went to NC State this year, and um, so she was stuck. Like, all right, well, what do I do now? Coaches still wanted her though, and those coaches uh, are right up her alley. Got along. So she, they offered her a, um, a spot with their team, not knowing what her percentage would be. She just said yes, and I'll wait for you guys to tell me what it is. And she got an offer, and it's nowhere close to what St. Fr Francis was offering. But, you know, she said she feels at home with those coaches. And uh, they obviously want her to follow them. So that's a good sign, and it's a good fit for her. Um, she, when she went to St. Francis, she says, the school's nice, but I like the coaches. So just kind of like he's saying, find the coach that likes you and wants you to play for their team. Yeah, That's she what makes went from um, mid-major to a team that had been consistently just getting in the first round of the tournament and usually getting knocked off to, all of a sudden, it bounced her to a power conference, top-tier conference ACC. She's going to be playing Florida State. Duke. Na yeah, Duke National Champion stuff. So, I mean, you, you really never know. So, so you got to keep your options open, and sometimes it work out great. Sometimes, like I said, it, it doesn't always work out great. Uh, so our recruiting, our, our process is really important, creating our support system. And, and like I said, when we talk to parents and stuff, when it's starting to create these bonds and, and know who your face is or who your contact, it, it really helps because – if you don't drink the Kool-Aid, it's going to be a bumpy ride. It, it really is. And the next thing you know, you're going to be looking like, well, they do this. Um, a couple teams do what we do. For sometimes people move laterally, and it, it works out. For sometimes they move, and it doesn't work out. All right, but, but you know, different organizations are trying to do it, and then this is the, the big goal. And I'm telling you, it's us, the aces, select. 
okay? Uh, and, you know, top gun with their top tier teams. Their, their best team, their organization is probably a team you never even hear of because they're pretty low key. Uh, the Angels out of Topeka. That is by far their, their, their best team. Mm -hmm. And they only have like a maybe one or two D1 recruits. And they're all, every tournament they go into, PGF, holy smokes, Angels finished ninth? And they lost their first bracket game. Yeah, that, that was Shire. They oh, finished Shire. seventh. Okay. Uh, but Angels, every tournament they, they've gone to, they finish in the, in the top five. Yeah. And you would never know uh, a whole lot about these guys because they're, they're pretty under the radar. And, you know, and they, they're just kind of cutting back. But, you know, they're, they're a great ball team. And they figured it out a few years ago, too, just to kind of touch on this one last time is that. Every one of the kids on their team were signed to go to like uh, UCM, Pittsburgh State, Emporia, Northwest Missouri, Washburn. Washburn. Um, they found out that for those kids to get the money that they needed to get and get recruited, it was the best thing for them to go play PGF in California for nationals. And they've, and they've gone every year since. Yeah. So oh. it's, you know, it's not about the distance, it's, just, it's about the system. And that's just the way that the system works. Now, so in, in closing, let me say my last things, uh, and then we'll get any questions. So, I've been with the Zephyrs, like I said, like going on uh, two, four, five, six years now. I think so. Six years, and um, it's been it's been a great ride. You, you'll see a lot of teams within that that time that have changed over three, four times. Um, not to say we haven't got hit up by every major organization out there to be one of their teams. Um, I seen Rob at an Avila hitting camp, and uh, the things he he touched on, and his uh, love for softball reminded me of everything I grew up on with my family and my my dad in softball and baseball. So that I kind of just took a liking to his his belief, and as we uh, he asked me to become a Zephyr, um, we seen nothing but class come from you know from him and coaches asking about him. They they all think highly of the Zephyrs now. There's other organizations out there that may put bigger school, these girls in bigger schools, but you don't get that about their character of the coaching staff or the girls. Um, and that's kind of what I care about. You know, wins are great, all that stuff, championships, but like creating something like a memory for these girls who have, you know, four or five years with us, is something that I strive for with my team. And hopefully, you know, I see, I have more interaction with Kristen's team than I do do with Craig's team, um, and you guys, you guys see that we we just kind of push them as much as we can. And when they get around our older girls who are committed, you see them shine, and you can see that work ethic. Want to be like them? You know, we're not a team that if a, a foul ball comes our way, we're gonna not pick up the ball because you're the other team. You know, we're gonna go out of our way to show good character to umpires, to other teams, and especially our coaches and our teammates. And that's what I strive for for being a Zephyr. And I'm sure these two are, are right behind. So, you know, that's what I, I hope you're getting out of staying with the Zephyrs, of believing, believing in the Zephyrs. And just, uh, girls, when you, when you wear that out in public, it means something. I wear this everywhere. Everyone knows I'm a Zephyr. We went out to breakfast this morning. This waitress goes, oh, I think you guys are part of the softball community. I mean, she sees my hat. She sees my white PGF. Uh, you know, sweater. So it never, it never leaves you. People notice it. Um, wear it with pride, and uh, you know, don't do stupid stuff when you have it on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, like Warren said, <laughs> open it up for questions. Yeah, hey, questions. <clears throat> so, sometimes, like at camp too, I, I forgot to mention this, but but when kids go to camp. They, they need to have a plan before they go in. I was explaining this to, to another parent. So, so ladies, like if you go into camp and you're going there, these this is what you need to do. You need to wear purple on purple. I, it's my least favorite outfit, but I'm gonna tell you why. Every organization wears black. Every organization wears their white and stuff, but there's not tons of purple on purple teams. So you immediately go out there and coaches can see you stand out without even doing anything, okay? The other thing, you need to, when you're at camp, you need to make a point to go and talk to those coaches, and you need to ask them questions. questions yeah. You need to ask them, and, and good questions, not, you know. Shake their hand and introduce yourself and look them in the eye. Yeah. 
So, so what, what about profile content. sheets? Profile sheets. Like tomorrow we're going to Lee Dobbins thing. I know five or six of our girls are. Do we hand out profile sheets tomorrow to I the coaches? I would take them, but I wouldn't hand them out. If they ask? Yeah, if they, they ask. ask them, okay. Okay. Uh, so, so you go there with intent and then find a way to work yourself up into the line. And you need to go and make friends immediately and show that you care about other kids and you root along. You cheer for that girl that can't field that ball. Like you tell her, hey, you, you do it. Because it sends a message to coaches that you're going to be a team player. Okay? And if you're not there yet, because I've been around enough kids to know, you know, some kids aren't like that, but, but you need to fake it until you make it. <laughs> All right? <laughs> but you, you need to go and show that, hey, you love playing softball, that, that you're going to play hard, and that you're going to cheer on people that you don't know because that's the right way to play softball. Because that's what they want in their organization. Because you, you look at every kid in that camp, and that is who you are competing against. And if you see one girl that's like the best ball player, like, holy smokes, that girl's really good. You need to go by her and start working by her. Work your way into her. Does that make sense? I, I know it's subtle, but, but it's the plan, and it will help. All right? And you know, like I said, if you, if you like it or whatever, tell them how much you like it. Of course, you know, the, the routine thing is always go get your picture taken with coach and tell her thank you and really love your camp. And then if you really did, go back and do research on the school. Do they actually have, you want to be a vet? Do they offer it? If not, oh, man, I really like that coach, though. Okay? And that coach, if she remembers you, they might have your offering, but they, can re they will refer kids back and forth. Uh, I'm filled with 2020s. Of pitchers. This girl's a really good pitcher, but we've already signed. Do, 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 do. Hey, Chrissy Nunn and Emporia. This girl came through there. I heard, don't you need a pitcher? Um, you know, here, here's your name. They might reach out to you, they may not. So go into camp with, with that plan or like anything that, that you do. Talk to their players. If they have players work at the camp, treat them as nice or nicer than you treat the coaches. Listen to them when they tell you to do something, if they engage in a conversation, talk to them. Because you're gonna learn a lot from them. You're gonna learn about what they really feel like playing there. Um, and they, you can sometimes just come right out and ask it, or you can kind of hear it in their answers. So it's always good to talk to kids at camps that actually play there. Um, another reason it is a good reason is because a lot of times when a coach is serious about a player, he'll ask his kids after camp, hey, what'd you think of that girl? And they'll say, she has issues, coach. We don't want her on the team. She has talked to me the yeah, whole time. Yeah, she, she, she thought she was all that. And you'll, you'll, sometimes you'll get that, and then you know that makes it really hard for that coach to, to, to be attracted to you because the rest of the team that was there didn't like you. That never works. So that's why it's so important to make sure you have a good rapport with the girls that are working the camp. Too. Parents, step back. Let her do whatever she's going to do. If she sucks that day, Make sure the world doesn't know that you think she sucks. Okay? You, your body language needs to be good. Be, because she, she's going to play whatever she's going to play. You, you can't control if she feels it or whatever. So just be a fly on the wall. You know, just talk to other parents, smile. Uh, you know, hey, if they ask you who your kid is, there she is. All right? So, so you just want to be able to step back. Uh, don't be the guy like, oh man, she, she can't hit today or whatever. They don't care. She's feeling sick. They really don't when they're watching your kid. Well, you know, she might have a few misses, but, but they're looking at the big picture. They're like, they, we know within 10 minutes whether your kid can play softball or not. We really do. It takes, it takes me 10 minutes to camp say, hey, this girl can hit. This girl needs work. This girl... She's at square one, okay? And that, that, that's it. Ten minutes is probably less time than it takes. So you already want to be prepared. You, you've already played at a high enough level that, that we know you can do it, all right? But, and then parents, man, let her do her thing. Just step back. She, if she, she's bad that day, she's bad that day. Don't punish her and take her out. You know, don't take away ice cream. All right. Uh, you know, they, they won't always be good. One thing for the girls, uh, just know that as coaches, we're not going to lie to college coaches for you guys about your 
about your work ethic, about your character. Yes, we want to see you guys get committed, and we're excited for you that you're getting interest, but I don't want to ruin my reputation saying you're a good worker when all you do is give attitude the whole practice. Like, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And I'm sure your coaches feel the same way. Just know that. They see what you do in practice. They see what you do in games. They see how you treat others. They, with, they are your biggest supporters, so make them feel the love. Questions. No social media question. I've got one for you two, Rob Mark. What do you guys expect of your girls when they show up in the fall that first time, and what type of physical shape do you expect them to be in? Um, or your girls coming back as sophomores? We do. What are the expectations? We do a fitness test, and we'll do one after they come back from um, Christmas break. Um, they'll run a 300 yard shuttle in under, I think we're going to do like one minute this time, 60 seconds, because they got the one minute 10 pretty good. <laughs> um, and that's tough. So it's just basically, you know, we do that in the fall, and they start lifting right away in the fall. They start going to, to our, we have, we're really lucky here, you know, because we have a strength and conditioning coach, and a lot of the smaller schools don't have somebody that does strength and conditioning that each coach, individual coach, is responsible for their own programs. We've got a professional here, and she's awesome, and she played college softball. So we're very fortunate that, that Coach Rodden is here because she can do that. And she sets up the plans for the kids. They get an off-season plan that they need to do from Coach Rodden. And, um, you know, we know when they come back that they haven't done it because they'll be the first girl throwing up. And trust me, every year we have one or two that are throwing up. Every school is different. Like, we have – we're not super rigorous either. Once, once we get going, we don't spend tons of time on the physical fitness. Yeah, I'm not a running, running coach. I don't think running is a form hey, of punishment. We, so. we work at ball skills. Softball is not a super running. There, there are coaches out there that you got to do a mile, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, I know I Dana down in Avila is doing like 5 a.m. Workouts and stuff. Yeah, that's that, that's show, just not show, us. Show. That's a great question. If I'm you're just being more recruited, wondering about the strength and the speed part because going from this level of ball, college ball, the speed of the game it goes so it's up not gonna, It's no matter if you're in a high not, U2, D1, whatever the case may be. It's not going to change dramatically from the the fall of her uh, or from her yeah the fall of her uh, senior mm -hmm. year to you know the. the no, when she graduates high school until she gets to college. She's not going to get that much better. So when she gets to college, we already understand that if she's a really super elite athlete when she gets here, she's going to hold her own. But if there's kids that are probably marginal, then we know that it's going to be a process. Uh, this year we had 11 freshmen. 11? 8 or 11? 11 freshmen. Um, and unfortunately, out of those 11 freshmen, most of them haven't really had a lot of weight training experience. Which is another thing that so is beneficial like, for them to oh, 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 yes. 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 The biggest thing, the biggest thing as far as the weight training and the conditioning is, is make sure that they have a coach that teaches them proper form. The proper form is everything. Coach Rodden will not let our girls start lifting heavy weight if they don't know how to use proper form. They're lifting sticks and bars until they can do the mechanics right. Um, and she's a stickler about that. And then you'll see girls start to get tremendous gains. I mean, we have a strong team. We always have for the last three years, we've got girls that are like beast strong. And so, and it's because of what she does. Um, but yes, get into a weight training program. Learn how to lift weights. Because if you're not gonna play college softball and not lift weights. Yeah, the sooner the better. I can tell you right now, it's not gonna happen. You will lift weights. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So, and also just, just for some of the kids that are committed, once you're committed, you're not saying that. Yeah, that's the step one. So that's step one, right. And, and, and I know a lot of people in the, in the community will get that mindset when you're committed, oh, I'm committed, I'm good. I don't have to keep working. There, there is so, so senior season, senior, senior year summer, between when you graduate till you go to that freshman year of college, you want to keep playing the highest level of competition we'll throughout that senior that. summer yes. to hard. prepare for that. We're work not taking harder. summers off. We're not taking tournaments yeah. off. We're still like, working hard throughout. Even Mark says work harder because, you know, your, your kid wants an opportunity to get on the field for her fall when she gets there as a freshman. Right when she gets there. And if she takes that summer off, she's going to be a summer behind everybody else yeah. because, you know, it's just the facts. And so it's, she just needs to make sure that your kids, once they're committed, they actually have to work harder. 
is now they have to start doing this. They have to start living a college lifestyle. They have to start getting on a regular schedule of when to get up, throw the weights, you know, have a weight training coach, when to practice, when to play, uh, and, and feeding themselves properly. So it's, you know, an athlete is an athlete, and no matter what sport it is, and softball is no different. They have to do all those things. So I would say once they're committed, it's very important. So it, sh it also shows well with coach when you Yeah. Sure. So that is the first step. And you're going to feel great once you get your verbal or get committed. But what that means is now the real work starts. Okay? So, so you, when I say work harder, you, you need to make sure you are getting better every day. All right? Because, and they'll start coming to your games a lot more once you're committed. They want to know if the money that they're throwing at you is going to be well spent. They, they want to see growth still. They, they already like you, okay? Sometimes they even love you, but they still want to see you getting better. They don't want to see a kid that's all said, and I'm committed, I'm gonna start downplaying. They, they, they want you to go out there, compete, and like, oh man, that girl's gonna be great once she gets here. So, so, so it's work harder. The first step, and it's the stressful step, is I got my place that I love. I'm, I'm signing here. And now, the, the real work. And when you get to college, then all, holy smokes, then the whole other, you know, can opens up. Because this is really, I'm telling you, I'm not kidding you, this is only about 15% of the college softball experience. It's just this actual playing softball. This is that the, what our kids do on a daily basis. Only 15% is their softball life, okay? So... You know, this is like quantum physics for you guys. We're not even going to get into it. All right? That, that's with our 18s, like getting them prepped for what you're actually going to be doing. I mean, because their scheduling is just, it's only a small part of the iceberg. Uh, I know you got to tell me, because I can talk around, or you got to ask your questions, and so we can go home and get some. Audrey's hungry. She wants some pizza tonight. <laughs> Ladies, you got questions? You still want to play college softball after all this? Hey, so wait, wait, cost? I know uh, some parents might have. Um, it, it's it's a hardship to travel. I'm to out of kidneys, man. All, all these, yeah, <laughs> for real. I mean, it, it it takes really a community to help get these girls where they want to be, and I, I hope you guys understand this. It's, I mean, it takes two jobs from you know both parents at times to fundraisers to whatever we can do. Um, you know, Mark and I both really stressed having this meeting just because we've gone through with our girls and we see where your girls are at now and we, we want to do more, we want to help. So anything we can do uh, besides, you know, paying for your dues, <laughs> have enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anything we can do to help, please. Uh, one, one last thing. So we talked about recruiting services. One, one person that we worked with, um, and this was only for from Rob's go ahead was uh, Sherry Nardine for CSA, and she's part of the Glory uh, um, Texas Glory organization, and she really uh, friended our family really well. So I do send girls to her that I feel that either they think they can't get there on their own, or it's just getting close to that time where they're running out of time. And um, the, out of three girls I've sent to her, two have committed. Um, they probably would have committed without her, but in that process, they've done so. I don't so. know about Hannah, because Hannah wasn't great about sending her emails. Yeah. She signed with Sherry Not Me, mm -hmm. had a great camp, and did a couple things. She's going to Butler Community College, which is one of the best schools for softball at the community college level, where their kids all bounce D1. Mm -hmm. uh, what, how many national champions is Butler one? Two. Two. Two, 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 two seasons undefeated. Yeah, they're, they're on back to back to back. So it's probably going to be a really good fit for Hannah. Like I said, everybody's path is a little bit different. But, you know, Sherry with her connections and stuff, her husband is Ed Nogdine, who runs in Texas Glory. Uh, it makes a big difference. It, it really does. And Sherry is every stinking tournament, every big tournament, California, yeah, Texas, Georgia. Every one of those and coaches. all the coaches know who she is yeah. and they respect her. So it's not everyone she's a legitimate sure. person. There's no question. And, and like you said, she was on a Hannah was on a path of probably not getting not committed. Gonna make it. Probably. One of the better shortstops at her age group. And she just, you know, she's the type of kid that it's gonna happen or it's not. Parents kind of the same way. You want her to play, but she's not doing the work. 
you know, it's kind of that. And um, and Sherry stepped in and helped her. Well, on the back side of that, uh, they, they the Nadim family asked our son, Jonathan, to start uh, editing videos for her, for hitting, fielding, pitching. And they gave, they gave my son all their techniques, how to edit them. We got them the software. So my son's available to, to do that if you guys want to start filming videos, we can you know, make the connection and start making that happen. He charges 40 bucks for Sherry to do, to do it for their organization. I'm sure he'll, you know, he'll work something out, but anything we can do like that to help get those videos out. Because the coaches I do talk to, they do tell me, do you have video? Yeah, we yeah. want to see video. What is your question, man? Um, like now, like the app protesting, did the coaches we, follow Most coaches that do that or? themselves. To be honest with you, I, it's neat to see these kids. It's great for them to get their accolades because they're great athletes. But in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't make you a better softball player. Um, it makes you a great athlete, but we do that anyways. When we get here, we're doing ex exit velocity. We're, we're, we're doing miles per, we're doing all that stuff. So when they get here, we set our own metrics, what we see with our eyes, and then we know where they're at now and where they're at every year as they progress through the four years. So in your, in your eyes, would you recommend this? I would, I would tell you no. <laughs> see, I would tell you yes, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Sorry, right. if you get one metric, it gives you a baseline of what they need to get. Because most average college girls are going to be in this area. So if you have a metric of a beginning, like, oh, yeah, she can throw, it doesn't equate to she's going to actually be a good softball player on the field. But arm strength is like a first indicator. Exit velocity off of that. It just gives you a baseline of, like, hey, this might be something I need to get better at at practice. Like, She's a good batter, but her exit velocity is like only 53. That's, she's not going to hit a lot of dingers. That's what that tells me. Well, it just means she's got poor swing. Yeah, so it gives you an indication of something that you can specifically work on. Should it be your end all? No, it's just one little facet. It's a tool. But yeah, it's a tool. So we're split. He says yes, I say no. But I say maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I'm a, I'm a former teacher, but it would be like an indication like this is a area of focus, you know, but, but you want a good, well-rounded ball player. Just because she can swing, her exit velocity is 72. If she swings at every bad pitch, yeah. she's still striking out, all right? <laughs> they don't let you just hit the ball off the tee during the game like, oh, hey, hold on, she's coming up, get her in the tee, you know, so. That, that's it, but that, that's a pretty good question. But it's all right. I mean, we have different opinions on different things. So. A lot. Yeah. You might hear us across the field at some point. It doesn't matter. We all <laughs> and, and, and trust me, Mark kind of touched on it. You get past this. You know, it does. It does go by. It's expensive, um, but it's a time well spent. You know, it's it's some. Oh, it's a time you get to spend with your kid. That sometimes you'll fight. Sometimes you'll you know you're not fighting. But you're spending the time with them, and that makes such an important thing. Uh, it's a it's such an important piece of their lives is they get to spend that time together, whether they like it or not. Right now, trust me, they'll appreciate it later. Um, I'm about eight years down the road now from having my kids go through this and go to college and graduate and everything else, and we seem to strangely have a lot more money to spend now than we had back then. And so, you know, it, but we went through it. You know, we did it. And we look back now and we're, we're, not, we're not disappointed that we did it at all. We're not unhappy, you know, and we're not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, you know, paycheck to paycheck type people. Um, so it's, it's one of those things where it's, it's definitely well worth it. Um, if, it's, if it's really hard and it's really a struggle, where it's costing you being able to, you know, your do your dreams. basic essentials. Ask for help. Yeah, ask for help. But you know, for the most part, if you're motivated enough and you want to do it, it's time well spent, and you can do some fundraisers, you can do some other stuff to help out to offset the cost. Um, but it's 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 worth it. It really is in the end. It's worth it because our kids now they they really remember those times that we spent together traveling and staying in hotels and playing in tournaments and those type of things. Those big big tournaments too. They usually offer a camp. Like the Tulsi Elite, those are really good ones to go to too. If you're that, that kid that hasn't signed or anything, because there will be a million 
D2s and NAIA people that are working. Those, those are good springboards. I forgot to mention that. That's another thing, camps. Which ones do they go to? Which ones are money grabs? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say straight on this right now because I, I lived on both sides. When I, when I did coaching college, I, I, was, I had that same mindset. I know what they're using this money for, they're using it to pay their assistants. They're using it to pay their, you know, whatever else. And then I got coaching in college and I realized, wow, was I wrong? Because he's a part-time guy. He don't make much money, okay? And I have volunteer assistants that I'd like to, you know, give them a hundred bucks here and there just for, you know, helping. Um, that I can't afford to pay out of my own salary that schools just absolutely don't have the money to pay. So I think that it's a necessary thing to do because that, that part of it, but the biggest part of it is, is that I get to meet your kid face to face. And I get to look in that kid's eye and see if there's any kind of a connection there. And I can see how she accepts coaching. Because if she's not coachable, we can pretty much tell within an hour or so this kid's not gonna be coachable. And she's gonna be really difficult to work with. And that to me is the most important part of the camp is if, if a kid wants to get to know a coach and say, hey, I can fight for this person, then it's the most important thing they can do. Because that's when the coach can actually work with them and actually talk to them. That they can't do out at tournaments or see on a video. They can't do any of that. So the camps to me, um, they're probably the most important thing. All you of them. The, the money grab All ones is if they're not interested in your kid. Don't go there. You know, here's the stuff, here's the stuff that you don't want to do. The triple crown type stuff. That's what I'm talking about. No. You don't need to play in an all-star game. You don't need to play in an academic all-star game. That's an extra 200 bucks or 300 bucks for that weekend you don't need to spend. But you need to go to, to there's probably, what, three camps during the year that are big camps, like Top Gun has one, Tulsa Elite has one, PGF has one. Those are the big ones where there's going to be a lot of coaches there and they're going to be really bought in and you're going to see a lot of coaches. Go to the campus once. You want to go. You, you want your kid to go set their foot on campus, look at their facilities, meet their people, get a feeling for the environment, and that's the only way they're going to be able to do it. Just taking a, 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 a non-official visit and walking through the campus is great, but it doesn't teach you that part of it. So making sure that you send them to camps is important. It, it, it just really is. We we had girls do both. A lot of the multi-coach camps. And um, we got good feedback from them, but not one of our kids have gotten recruited from a multi-coach camp yet. It's all been individual or uh, in a game scenario where they've seen them, you know, succeed and come back. That's true. Yeah, that's kind of what we've experienced. Yeah. Farley Dickinson, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I would tell you, you need to make sure you you keep on contact with them. Camp's a little far away, isn't it? She's already. There. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, but even like, like when you're committed, one. you still want to be able to go to camp sure. and, and do oh, things yeah. like that. Uh, borderline girls, uh, you got some offers on the table, I understand, correct? So like until you make a decision, those are people that, that you definitely want to pursue in a very positive light. Uh, you know, and it just takes you where it was. Uh, Riley, you're working the camp circuit now, correct? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, We'll be talking about it here. But one of the purposes of the meetings is now that you have a face of people that you need to come to to talk to to help you with, with your plan and your path. Because if you don't know or you have a question and you're not certain, I'm telling you, people fill it up with usually the wrong stuff. Okay? So, I mean, that, that's, that's why we're here. So you have a face. I brought in my little cards just in case. So, so you have a contact, an email. Uh, you know, if you're on Tiffany's team, you bounce at her, but I'm here to basically help everyone, uh, you know, and, and help Rob. Rob's at the point with our MNU team where, uh, you know, when I say benevolent benefactor, he keeps tabs. If something happens in a tournament to one of our teams, like Tiffany's team or whatever, whoever the, the tournament uh, organizer, he calls him. Like, hey man, I heard this happen with your kids. Or, hey, wow, I was calling you, your, your kids finished first, awesome. All right, whether it's good or bad, they contact him because he is the network, he is the source. And, you know, Rob, Rob's time with college, he can't always be at all of our games or help us with practice every once in a while. We will use this facility as a main practice 
facility during the summer so that we can bring everybody in and have one Sunday where we can work everybody co co cohesively so that we can start building this, this network of support so that, you know, we want to make it where 18s are cheering on 16s, 16s are cheering on 14s, and 14s are cheering on uh, the 18s. So we have this nice little growth pattern. Our model is to keep it small. We might add 12 somewhere down the line, 14, 16, and 18s. We don't need a million teams. Like all of a sudden, I'm not. Top Gun does a good job, but all of a sudden, boom, they're like the firecrackers, in my opinion. You cannot swing a bat without hitting some girl that plays for Top Gun, in my opinion. Now, if you got California, that's what the firecrackers are. But Tony Rico, you this, just for being around a long time, the coaches don't know who Top Gun is. College coaches, for the most part, you know, around here they do. Pretty but cool. in the in the, the whole thing of fifty states. They, they don't, they don't, the tournament directors, like that were put on the big tournaments, they don't know who they are. I mean, they're, they're, they're good and they're new and they got a lot of teams and nothing wrong with it. But, you know, like I said, time means a lot in this. You know, and we put a lot of time into this over the years and we built this, you know, basically the same way, mom and pop thing, just, you know, from the ground up. And, and that's, that's the way we want to keep it. You know, I don't, I'm not going to sit here and make a money off every one of, one of these players like they do like with the firecrackers and stuff like that. That's not my intent. You know, I like my job here. And I like having the Zephyrs because I feel real passionate about something that I built. So we'll never get like that. But, you know, just understand that you girls play for, you know, that, when you have that jersey on, you, you do stand out. People, people are going to give you their best game. They want to beat you, you know. And, and I think there's something cool about that. You know, if you're the team everybody wants to beat, that means you're pretty good. And I just think that there's something pretty cool about being that person that everybody wants to beat because then it just shows that they have respect for you. Mm -hmm. um, like I said earlier, there's only a handful, a couple clubs doing this, like Select.